Good morning. And a very warm welcome to this very special service this morning in which we will be celebrating 150 years of this building, which um, was first dedicated on the 24th of September, 1871. And 150 years later, we will also be rededicating it following its um, refurbishment. We're delighted this morning to welcome Lord Wallace, Jim, if I may be so bold, and his wife Rosie, who's down at the front, as our guests this morning, also to our distinguished visitors, and indeed to any visitors who are sharing with us in worship this morning. Very warm welcome to you all. Um, just a couple of practical announcements. Um, firstly, uh, there is a lunch in the hall at the end of the service, which you're very warmly invited for. Um, so the hall's over that way. But what I'm going to do at the end, and this will completely confuse the normal congregation um, who are so used to me doing it the other way, I'm going to release you row by row, but I'm going to start today at the front. So the front will be released first, and then we'll go backwards. Okay, I know you're used to it the other way, but today it's the opposite way around. Um, Jim will go to the door, so you'll have an opportunity to meet the moderator as you go out. But it's just to prevent, we're still obviously negotiating our way over the eggshells that we call COVID uh, regulations, and we don't want you all gathering at the door at the same time, so to kind of protect social distancing. So if you just stay seated at the end of the service until um, I come and let you go, so to speak. Okay? Um, just a couple of extra announcements. Firstly, um, can I remind the members of the Guild that you meet on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Any new members will be very warmly welcome. Um, the only instruction is, as ever, please bring your own cup. Um, again, that's because of COVID. And secondly, from next week, um, we're going to start doing an intimation sheet, um, which is partly to save the minister's voice uh, for the intimations. So if you do have an intimation that you want to draw to people's attention, if you could let Lynn Armstrong know either by phone or text or email or if you see Lynn at the end of the service, and we'll, put, we'll compile them on an intimation sheet. And so we come to our call to worship. We stand today in the shadow of the past. Lord, make us thankful for yesterday's mercy. We stand today before the challenge of the present. Lord, grant us faith for today's tasks. We stand today in the light of future promise. Lord, offer us hope for tomorrow's opportunity. We stand today before God, Lord of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let us praise God in heart and voice. Let us worship God as we sing the hymn, Lord for the Years.
In Solomon's prayer of dedication at the opening of the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon says, May your eyes, O God, be open towards this temple night and day, this place of which you said, My name shall be there. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, on this day of celebration and thanksgiving, as we mark the 150th anniversary of this building to your glory and its refurbishment for our modern age, we marvel at your goodness, mercy, and care which you have shown to your children. This is a day of memories, a day when we look back at the past with gratitude at the fellowship you have created, the service to our community which you have blessed, the goals we have reached, and the faith that has been shared. God of yesterday, receive our praise. This is a day of looking forward and anticipating the future the challenges that will be faced, the opportunities that will be grasped, the support and friendship that will be offered, the lives that will be changed by Christ's presence. God of tomorrow, receive our praise. Receive too, God of mercy, our confession of our faults the times when we have made promises that were not kept, when our words have pledged loyalty to you, but our lives have pointed to service to self. Forgive us our failings, O Lord. And as we stand today between past and future, may we grasp this present and live it to your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite the moderator now to say a few words to um, our young people and those of us who are still young at heart. come down. You, to, you stole my line, I was going to say, for the young people in age and for everyone here who is still young at heart. Where are some of you? Yes, there are some people, young people. Uh, the first thing is, when I was introduced there, I was introduced as the moderator. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you, does it? <laughs> to the young at heart, yes, to then the young people. What it means is that the way we organize ourselves in the Church of Scotland, we have a general assembly every year, you've probably heard about it, where ministers go and elders go, uh, and the moderator is the person chosen to preside over the general assembly, to chair the general assembly, which we did this year, uh, mostly online, 700 plus people on Zoom, which was a challenge in itself. And then for the, rest, the next 51 weeks of your year in office, you are an ambassador for the church, doing things like today, the great pleasure of getting out and meeting people. Uh, but when I became moderator, I was presented with a ring and a cross. And I wear these when I'm here on, on occasions when I'm uh, in moderator role. And when the next moderator, moderator takes up office uh, in May next year at the General Assembly, I'll pass them on. Now, I wonder if one of the young Two, is, it, is there more than two young? If you want, would you like to have a look at this ring? If I can get it off. <laughs> do, you, 
Mind if you hold that, please? <laughs> that was maybe a stupid thing to suggest. <laughs> it usually comes off all right. <laughs> yeah, there's what. Do you have a look at it? Can you tell me what you see? Can you tell me what you see there? It's very old, so it's faded a bit. Let me see if someone else can have a look. Maybe the gentleman sitting here. Can you see what's, what's in it? It's the Church of Scotland emblem. It's the Church of Scotland emblem, which is a burning bush. And uh, who knows the story of the burning bush? Do you know the story of the burning bush? Do you know who saw the burning bush? One of the, do you know who's perhaps one of the younger at heart? Remind us all who saw the burning bush. Moses, yes, of course, Moses. And uh, Moses was tending sheep for his father-in-law, and he saw this bush burning. And the amazing thing was that in spite of all the fire, the bush wasn't being burnt up. It was still there intact as a bush. And as he approached it, he realized that God was in the bush, and God wanted to speak to him and told Moses that the Israelites, who had been slaves in Egypt, that he wanted Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And Moses was very doubtful. He didn't think he had the ability to do it. And God said, look, I will be with you. I will guide you. Have the courage. Follow my words, and you will lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And Moses took God at his word and then proceeded after some time and some, uh, un, you know, some difficult times, he did actually lead the Israelites out of Egypt. So when I look at this ring, I'm reminded of the burning bush and God speaking to Moses and saying, you know, you can do things. You may not think you can do things, but with God's power, you can. And this was a ring which was an old signet ring. You put wax on it if you wanted to seal something, and it was sealed on behalf of the Church of Scotland. Uh, and that was a, a commitment, a promise. If you sealed something, that was a promise. Now, I'll come over to the other side, because I've also got this cross, which hopefully I can get off a bit more easily. Even it's more difficult to put on again. <laughs> and I'll ask the young, this young person here. You want to have a look at this cross? Right, hold it. And what do you see? You see there's a cross, but what else do you see? Yes, there's a fire. There's also the burning bush. And in it, there's the motto of the Church of Scotland, non tamen non consumibator, which means in Latin, which is the old language of the Romans, neither yet was it consumed. So the, the bush didn't burn up. But also there's the cross. Why do you think the cross is important? I don't know. I'm sure you do actually know. I think you're just being very shy. <laughs> yeah. What happened on the cross? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus was on the cross and Jesus died on the cross uh, for us. But if that's all that happened, if that just happened that Jesus had died, we wouldn't be here today. But actually, three days after, he rose again. And seven weeks after that, a spirit came and encouraged his disciples who had run away when Jesus was on the cross. They all ran away. They were scared. But just over seven weeks later, they were out in the streets of Jerusalem talking about Jesus, talking about Jesus had risen and talking about his message of love. And therefore, when I wear this cross, you know, I remember Jesus, the message of Jesus, the message of love. And when I think of the cross and the bush, it's the bush that doesn't consume, that, that God loves us. God's love never burns out, and it's a light, and it's a cross. And these are the things which I try to remember to guide me when I have my duties and my responsibilities as moderator, that whatever the task may be, and I sometimes tell you it's a bit daunting, uh, but that with God's help and God's guidance, you know, he's there to support me in doing it. So I hope you remember these pieces of jewelry because when I was about 15, 14, 
the moderator came to the church I was in, brought up in, in Annan and Dumfrieshire, and I remember being told, when you shake hands with him at the end, just look at his ring. And I did. I never thought once, ever, <laughs> that I would wear it one day. So you never know. You might wear it one day. <laughs> and if you're a bit daunted by it, just remember that as Moses was daunted when he saw the burning bush, when God says, but you can do it. I need okay. a dresser. I'll put it on again. <laughs> No, hang on, not a very efficient dresser. There you go. Hang on, you're coming off your throat. <laughs> Always pays a gym to have good stuff. One difficulty getting off, no difficulty getting Our first lesson this morning is to be found in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. And Lynn Armstrong, who's our Girls' Brigade captain, is going to read it for us. Hear the word of God. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives ability to everyone for their particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. The Spirit gives one person a message full of wisdom while to another person, the same Spirit gives a message full of knowledge. One and the same Spirit gives faith to one person, while to another person, he gives the power to heal. The Spirit gives one person the power to work miracles, to another, the gift of speaking God's message, and to yet another, the ability to tell the difference between gifts that come from the Spirit and those that do not. To one person, he gives the ability to speak in strange tongues, and to another, he gives the ability to explain what is said. But it is one and the same Spirit who does all this, as he wishes he gives a different gift to each person. Amen. Thank you, Lynn. We're going to sing now hymn 642, Ye that know the Lord is gracious.
Our second lesson is taken from St. John's Gospel, and we read from chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. It's entitled, Jesus Feeds 5,000 Men. After this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, as it is also called. A large crowd followed him because he had seen his miracles of healing those who were ill. Jesus went up a hill and sat down with his disciples. The time for the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked round and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. So he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he knew, uh, already knew what he would do. Philip answered, for everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. Another of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. Make the people sit down, Jesus told them. There was a lot of grass around. So all the people sat down. There were 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish. And they all had as much as they wanted. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces left over. Let us not waste any. So they gathered them all up and filled twelve baskets with pieces left over from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. Amen, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word, and to his name be the glory and praise. Thank you, Gordon. The hymn before we hear from the moderator is hymn 543, Longing for Light, We Wait in Darkness.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. It is my real privilege and pleasure to join you today as you celebrate the 150th anniversary of this church building and its rededication following refurbishment. And to bring you the warm greetings and congratulations on behalf of the General Assembly. Anniversaries, especially those ending in a zero or a five, in our culture seem to have a capacity just to fascinate us. And I was wondering if it might be interesting to ponder what our forebears would have been thinking about. What would they have been reading about in the news in 1871 as the Congregation of the United Presbyterian Church established here in Lochie in 1826, moved to this new place of worship because their numbers had outgrown the previous building. Now, the rugby-minded among them would have had cause to celebrate Scotland's 4-1, note the score, 4-1 win over England in the first ever rugby international. <clears throat> if you'd ventured to Edinburgh, you'd have seen Scotland's first tram system. Horse-drawn, of course, but whether on time or on budget, I don't know. 150 years ago this week, the Christian family learned of the death of Charlotte Elliot, author of Just As I Am Without One Plea. And 150 years ago today, people would still be wondering in this church what had befallen Dr. David Livingstone, as it was another seven weeks were to pass before Henry Stanley encountered him with the reputed remark, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Now, an anniversary is like a hinge a time for looking back, as well as a time for looking forward. And as we celebrate 150 years of the worship of God in this sanctuary, we remember the faithfulness of those who have preceded us. And we reflect on all that has happened here during that time. I remember a friend who has a scientific background saying to me one day in St. Magnus Cathedral how he marveled at the thought that there must be lingering molecules in the air or in the walls from long bygone days. And although not as old, the thought still remains that here in this place, over 150 years, children have been brought here for baptism. Marriage vows have been exchanged. Those who mourn have been comforted. People will have come here to give thanks for joyous occasions in their lives, or to seek, seek guidance from God at a time of anxiety. We can be sure that familiar metrical sang, psalms will have been sung here down the ages, and on many, many occasions, bread and wine will have been shared. And I have no doubt that there are records, Kirk records, of ministers, session clerks, and elders who have served faithfully here, as well as in the congregations which over the years have united together and now worship here, but the witness of this church and congregation would have been so much less without the thousands who sat regularly, Sunday by Sunday, worshipping God, and who during the week served their Lord and Saviour in a multitude of different ways. Their names may not feature prominently anywhere, but their witness has been vital. And they join the many ordinary and many nameless people who encountered Jesus in the gospel stories. Today we heard the familiar story of Jesus feeding a great multitude, a story which would be just as familiar to those who worshipped here in 1871 as it is to us today. And just as anonymous and nameless then as it is today is the boy who offered five barley loaves and two fish. But his offering was crucial for the miracle which Jesus performed. So let us reflect for a moment on that nameless boy and his offering. His offering was timely and it was modest. You know, as they say, timing is everything. People were getting hungry and no doubt restless. Philip was certainly getting anxious. No way did they have the money to buy enough bread for the crowd. And then a little boy steps forward with a modest offering. If he'd been distracted by his mates, or if he'd thought about it and then bottled it, 
the miracle would not have been worked by Jesus. My mother used to say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Now, this is probably not the time of the place to examine the underlying theology of that. But the saying has stuck with me over the years. How many times have we meant to write that letter, make that telephone call, send that email, offer that friendly word of encouragement, possibly to a friend going through a rough patch, or to a bereaved acquaintance, but we never quite got round to doing it. And yet, yet we also know of occasions when we did do so, and it has been timely. And it has been helpful. And I'm just thinking, if we're looking for some signs of hope and encouragement during the months when we've endured lockdown and restrictions, it may be to recognise that many simple acts of kindness which people have done for their neighbours or the call to the person lonely and isolated. Like the unnamed boy's offering, these acts or these calls may have been very modest, but they mattered. They have only taken a matter of minutes but they may have brightened someone's day, or given hope, or brought comfort. And Jesus took the small boy's offering, his small offering, and thousands were fed. And when we offer service to others in love, we can neither calculate nor overestimate the way God can increase its value. No doubt when this church was built in 1871 at a cost, I'm told, of £7,000 or £575,000 in today's prices, there would have been significant donors and benefactors to whom the congregation would quite rightly have been grateful. And today I know that this refurbishment has been made possible with the help and support of many generous donors listed on the back of the order of service. And again, we rightly express heartfelt thanks. But equally, I'm certain that the wealth of witness over the years has been created by the offerings of thousands of ordinary parishioners. Yes, offerings of money in the collection plate which will have been used well in the service of God's kingdom. But offerings too of talent and ability. The passage we read from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth reminds us of the gifts of the Spirit. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And just as spiritual gifts have enriched the life of this church in the past, they will surely be the offerings made in the future. As I said, an anniversary is a hinge. Not only do we look back, but we must also look forward. And we look forward to a future against a backdrop of a pandemic which has shaken so many certainties and at a time when our church is being challenged to face up to so much change. We're regularly reminded of the challenges facing the Kirk, not least the stark figure that 35% of ministers will reach retirement age in the next five years, the insufficient numbers coming through to replace them. Facing up to that reality, the General Assembly this year agreed to reduce the number of ministry posts to 600 plus 60 vacancies by 2025. And we passed a new Presbytery Mission Plan Act, within which presbyteries must work out the details. And that's the difficult bit. But of course, change is something which you had much experience here in Lochie, with four original Church of Scotland congregations merged over time eventually to form Lochie Parish Church in 2006. More recently, we've enjoyed the partnership working with the Camperdown and Lockheed Ministry, which has provided further exciting opportunities for serving your communities. But change breeds uncertainty, and in turn that can lead to anxiety. So it's important we are sensitive to and understanding of the concerns of many at this time. But as believers in our Lord, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it surely would be wrong to be defeatist. The late President John F. Kennedy once observed that the Chinese word for a crisis uses two brushstrokes. One brushstroke stands for danger and the other for opportunity. And in a crisis, he said, beware of the danger, but recognize the opportunity. 
And the challenge for our church is both to recognize the opportunity and to seize it. I've already referred to people during the pandemic who undertook many acts of kindnesses for their neighbors, neighbors whom they may not have ever known before lockdown. And I've become aware that during that time, people who previously showed little interest in institutional church life have been logging on to online worship. And these thoughts were in my mind as I read recently a book by Alan J. Roxburgh, uh, an American pastor, with the exceptionally long, challenging, and ambitious title, Joining God, Remaking the Church, and Changing the World. Although written sometime before COVID and from a North American perspective, its starting point is a familiar story of declining numbers, of aging congregations, and of strategy plans that just never quite succeed in reversing the trend. However, Roxburgh claims, I quote, we don't live in a world of unbelief. People are yearning to believe in something, but churches can't capture their attention. And then far from being downbeat, he goes on to say that he believes that the spirit is disrupting and calling our churches into a new imagination about it, what it means to follow the way of Jesus. And it is at such a time of change and upheaval that we need to be ready to sense where the Spirit is leading us. I think back to the story of that first Pentecost. The disciples were all gathered together in one place when the Spirit descended with wind and flame. But they didn't stay in that one place waiting for people to come in. They went out into the streets proclaiming the good news of the risen Jesus. And so today we celebrate a church with a history of outward-looking service in following the way of Jesus, not least in recent times in supporting those in recovery from substance abuse or opening a drop-in cafe. And we also celebrate a refurbished building at the heart of the local community, providing facilities throughout the week for this community, a modern place of worship, and a lively place and a community space which welcomes people in, and a place from where the ministry team and congregation can reach out into the community of Loch Ee with more ambitious plans to address the needs of vulnerable people. A real imagination about what it means to follow in the way of Jesus in 2021. This is an exciting time, and I wish God's blessing on you as you start this new chapter and look forward in faith. Amen. Thank you very much, Jim. Jim was speaking about change, and during lockdown, when we weren't able to sing hymns, we felt it was important that we still heard from Ninian and from our organ. So we introduced, as part of the order of service, a musical reflection. And gradually, over time, when we did start singing hymns again, a number of the congregations said, please don't get rid of the musical reflection, because it gives us space. And as someone who is a Celt and appreciates space in worship, I was pleased to hear that. So we're going to have a space now, as you can reflect on Jim's words and on the readings, as Ninian plays for us today's musical reflection.
Thank you, Ninian. In our prayers for others this morning, there is an invited response. When I say, God, take what we are, you're invited to respond and direct what we shall become. Let us pray. God, who dwells in every time and every place, at the beginning of a new chapter in the life of this congregation, we would pray for the church and for the world. We pray for those in our community who are under pressure, those whose relationships are at breaking point, those troubled by job insecurity or increased demands on time or energy, those struggling to make ends meet. Make us, we pray, the listening ears to those who are in trouble. God, take what we are and direct what we shall become. We pray for those in our society who are waiting, those awaiting a health diagnosis or appointment, those stuck in the groove of despair or depression and who seek a way out of darkness, those wrestling with the onset of infirmity or a terminal illness. Make us, we pray, caring hands to those in pain. God, take what we are and direct what we shall become. We pray for those in the world who are wrestling with uncertainty, those in war-torn regions who long for peace, and refugees who find themselves in strange lands, those anxious about climate change, and those in positions of leadership who search for solutions to impossible situations and problems. Make us, we pray, the strong shoulders to those who need carried. God, take what we are and direct what we shall become. We pray for the church in all its parts, those wrestling with doubts or misgivings, for fellowships where there is painful conflict or disagreement, for congregations facing closure or an uncertain future. Make us, we pray, welcoming arms to those who are hurting. God, take what we are and direct what we shall become. Gracious God, may your love, compassion, and strength reach out to all those who are in need, bringing to them through the witness of your people a sense of hope for the future. For the sake of Jesus and in his name we ask it. Amen. On the 24th of September in the year 1871, this building was opened for public worship by the Reverend Professor John Eady, who is Professor of Biblical Literature and Hermeneutics, which is interpretation for those of you who are less familiar with theologically big words in the United Presbyterian Church. The cost of the building at the time was £7,000, which in today's money is about 850000 Although the congregation raised about half of that, the balance was provided by the three Cox brothers, William, James, and George, Cox brothers being of jute fame. And James was to become the provost of Dundee from 1872 to 1875. That same day, before the treasurer gets excited, the offering was a thousand pounds, which in today's money is a hundred and twenty thousand pounds. So clearly there were some very wealthy benefactors. The congregation itself, though, has a longer pedigree, having started as the succession church in the Weavers Hall in Loch Ee on the 15th of June, 1826. As industrialization increased the population of Loch Ee, 
This resulted in the need for a much larger building, which could seat over a thousand. Apart from this building, Lockie West, there were originally another three Presbyterian congregations in Lockie. St. Luke's, which was originally the United Associate Succession Church, and that opened in February 1827. St. Ninian's, which originally was a chapel of ease of Liff Parish, and that was built in 1829 and was part of the Aldkirk. And Lockie East, which broke away from the Aldkirk at the disruption in 1843, becoming a free church, and it gained its own building in 1846. Lockie East and St. Ninian's were to reunite again, however, in September 1959, becoming Lockie Old. And then in October 1985, Lockie Old and St. Luke's united. The final part of the jigsaw was a union of Old and St. Luke's with Lockie West in October 2006. Following on from that union, the Trinity Project was formed with a view to raising funds to refurbish the new Lockie Parish Church for use by both church and community. Work finally began in the spring of 2020, despite a number of delays with bats in the belfry, and in May of this year, the congregation finally gained entry into the New Look premises. So I'm going to invite now Lord Wallace, the moderator, to rededicate this refurbished sanctuary and unveil the plaque. So if you'll just give us a moment, we'll go over to the side area. Oops. Help if I took my microphone with me. Shall we do the plaque first? Do the plaque first. Yes, I'll let you do the unveiling and then I'll read it out for everyone. There we go. Thank you. Uh, it says, you can have a look at it later, but it says Lockheed Parish Church Sanctuary was refurbished through the Trinity Project 2020 to 21 and rededicated to the glory of God by Lord Wallace of Tankerness moderator of the General Assembly on Sunday the 26th of September 2021, Gloria and Excelsis Deo, and I know we're not at Christmas carols yet, but you might remember from Christmas carols that means glory to God in the highest. As moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, I celebrate this anniversary with you and rededicate this church this building, this sanctuary, and its people for the glory of God and the service of Christ. Let us pray that peace be granted to this house and all who worship in it. Peace be to those who enter it and to those who go out from it. And peace be to those who love it and who love the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may now applaud, by the way. We couldn't really end our service with any other hymn, and I'm so pleased that you chose that, Jim, <laughs> uh, than look forward in faith, all time is in God's hand.
We have looked back to our yesterdays and given thanks. We celebrate today our new facilities. Now let us go into tomorrow as those who would see not only, the, not only what the world is, but what we can make it be. And may our hands, our heart, our voice be turned towards making it so. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all, now and always. Thank you.